Diana, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, very, very much for coming this evening. I can't think of a... It's nice to see so much green in the audience, little spots of green here and there. Uh, and I can't think of any better way to celebrate St. Patrick's Day than going to Cuba, right? Uh, and I can't think of any two people better to go to Cuba with than Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee, uh, my good friend from uh, California. We've known each other a long time. Uh, Barbara represents Oakland uh, in the, that district in the United States Congress. It used to be the ninth district, now it's the 13th. Um, she uh, is also, of course, maybe perhaps best known for being the only member of Congress to vote against the authorization for the use of military force after September 11, a vote which got her in a lot of trouble at the time, but now everybody realizes this is the right vote. Now we see what happened. Uh, and Barbara just told me she's been to Cuba 21 or 22 times. Peter Kornblue is also a good friend. We went to Cuba together in 1998, uh, Carol and I and our sons, and, and Peter was part of that uh, delegation. Uh, he is head of the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive and co-author of a wonderful new book called Back Channel to Cuba, which, for those of you who subscribe to the New York Review of Books, is reviewed in, here's the review, in this edition of the New York <laughs> Review of Books. I haven't seen that yet. Oh, there, oh, there <laughs> if you're good tonight, Peter, maybe I'll show it to you. And we're, it's very, very timely. You know, President Obama announced in December that he wanted to relax uh, U.S. Um, restrictions on Cuba and come up with a new set of rules and regulations, which in January uh, the Treasury Department revealed uh, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, the, both sides, the United States and Cuba, sat down for their third, I think it's the third round of talks, only lasted one day, uh, and uh, the United States said that it hopes to have our embassy opened in Havana by April 10. So there is uh, a lot going on. Um, so tonight we'd like to take a look at these new rules, what it means, um, what the implications are for policy, and what it means for the people of Cuba and what it means for the people of the United States, all of those things. Uh, Barbara, the centerpiece of this, the new um, deal, if you will, between the United States and Cuba was the release of Alan Gross in exchange for some other prisoners. I know you visited with Mr. Gross in Cuba and were very helpful in, in arranging that exchange. Tell us how you met him, what it was like, and um, what the, wow. some of the backstory there. <laughs> Well, first, let me say it's, it's nice. I, I, I thought I'd say it's nice to be off the hill, but I'm glad I'm still on the hill. Yes. <laughs> and the Hill Center is a great, great place. Uh, and thanks so much um, for having me here this evening. I, and let me just also uh, clarify the fact I've been to Cuba over 20 some times, but this is since 1977. Still, <laughs> yeah, but you've watched since it. Since 77, so I've yeah. seen, yeah. Our U.S. policy fluctuate up and down in Cuba, and I've seen Cuba through the uh, special period, through, you know, times of prosperity, you know, so I've seen it since the 70s, and really, this is long overdue. With regard to um, Alan Gross, well, first of all, I had, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and we fund USAID projects. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had a meeting today, a hearing today, where we talked about some of the USAID projects that are focused on democracy initiatives, opening up closed societies, uh, helping to send um, technology to, to countries that need to ensure that their citizens uh, have access to the internet. Well, all of this is fine and good and well. However, many of the USAID pr projects, especially you, you've heard Zuza Nail now, and we've seen what has been exposed in the last few months, have been part uh, of USAID's effort to open up countries such as Cuba. Okay, Alan Gross was working on a contract, USAID contract, uh, actually uh, bringing technology to the uh, Jewish community mm -hmm. in. Cuba. And unbeknownst to Allen, the Cuban, as a result of Helms-Burton, this was part of the Helms-Burton Act. But what Cuba did was institute laws that made it a crime for someone to do this. 
the problem I had, and one of the reasons I got really involved in Alan's case was, you know, that, that was not disclosed, and it's not disclosed necessarily to people who work on these contracts. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the laws of the country that you're working in, whether you um, consider yourself a consultant, a spy, an operative, whatever it is, you should know what you're doing, and yeah. you should know that you could be subject to arrest if, in fact, you're violating the laws of another country. Well, <laughs> a la Alan Gross. Yeah. And so I've, I visited Alan four or five times, four times, I think, when uh, he was incarcerated. I know the Cuban Five case very well. Uh, this goes way back. Sam Farr and I both have been in, involved in that. And so we knew that, um, and we talked to Cubans many times, and we knew that given the public opinion in Cuba around the Cuban Five and uh, the, the fact that there was no way in exchange or any effort could take place as long as Alan Gross was in because the Cubans would not allow that with the Cuban Five still here and given the fact that Cubans wanted the Cuban Five home. It's a long legal case that uh, is too detailed and, and cumbersome to go into now, but bottom line is there were negotiations taking place about the release of the remaining Cuban Five. There were three left and the release of Alan in addition to another high value uh, operative that the United States wanted. But in addition to that, this, as, as unfortunate as Allen's incarceration was, because the other problem I had with that is the, quote, crime that he was incarcerated with, he got, I think it was 15 years. And I thought that was way, 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 just in terms of my sense of justice for any crime committed, whether you're guilt, whether you believe you're guilty or not, 15 years was just too much. And so we started just trying to get a humanitarian release. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, for Allen, right. because that was just totally ridiculous. But it evolved into a five-year negotiation, which ultimately led to the positive developments that we're seeing now. And uh, it's too bad that Allen had to stay in jail that long, and the Cuban Five had to stay in jail that long. But the outcome of this is we see some positive developments. And Peter, in your book, I mean, so I have to tell you, as part of the White House press corps, when this was announced in December, it stunned everybody at the White House because nobody knew that there were any negotiations ongoing with Cuba. Um, and suddenly the president says, you know, I've just talked to Raul Castro on the phone and we're making this big announcement. But your book came out just, what, about a month ahead of time called Back Channel to Cuba. So this has been, these talks have been going on like for a long time, right? Well, I wish we had the book here. Does anybody have the book? I wish I did. Yeah. No, but. I, I, I like to say I don't carry it around because it's too heavy, but uh, I don't want to deter you from, uh, from, from looking at it. Uh, and it's called Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. And it tells a story that, that certainly seems very relevant. Uh, Barack Obama is not the first president to have negotiated with Cuba, although he's the first president to fully succeed. Uh, he's not the first president to try, and there have been secret talks going all the way back to the Kennedy administration. Um, Kennedy uh, uh, was in talks with uh, Fidel Castro. To Even after or before Bay of Pigs? After the Bay of Pigs. Uh, of course, the Bay of Pigs was right at the beginning of the Kennedy's administration. He actually inherited that operation from, from the Eisenhower administration. He let it go forward, uh, and then... Just five months later, Fidel sent an emissary, Che Guevara, to track down uh, John F. Kennedy's top aide on Latin America, Richard Goodwin, and they met uh, on an all-night session in Montevideo, Uruguay, uh, and uh, Che Guevara said, thank you for the Bay of Pigs. Uh, you've helped us consolidate the revolution, uh, and you transformed us, allowed us to transform ourselves from an aggrieved little country into an equal. Uh, and as an equal, we want to have peaceful coexistence with, uh, with uh, the capitalist world, and uh, we think that we can coexist, we can have a modus uh, vivendi, uh, and what is it going to take? Um, and actually, these, the first kind of serious talks and discussions uh, started under the, the Kennedy administration. Uh -huh. And off and on? Off and on. Um, Through the years. Huh? Kissinger, uh, Kennedy, of course, was killed, uh, really right at even... Uh, you know, this is a historical irony uh, and coincidence, but on the day that John F. Kennedy was killed, he had an emissary meeting with Fidel Castro in, 
Veradero Beach, uh, a French journalist who was carrying a message from Kennedy about possible reconciliation. And, and they both listened on the radio as the news came in that, that Kennedy had died. And Fidel Castro said, there goes your mission of peace. Uh, and it's true. We, we didn't get back to a real effort to improve and normalize relations um, until 10 years later when Henry Kissinger uh, decided uh, that uh, the mid-1970s would be a propitious time. He faced a situation somewhat similar to what Barack Obama faced, a kind of mutiny in Latin America. Um, Barack Obama in some ways was pressured by the Latin American countries to include Cuba in the Summit of the Americas, the one that's coming up in, in April, and, and, and uh, Cuba is for the first time included. Back in Kissinger's days, the Latin American countries were saying, we're going to vote to lift multilateral sanctions that you imposed on Cuba. We were going to restore our diplomatic ties to Cuba and our economic ties to Cuba. Uh, and uh, uh, Kissinger said, oh, well, all right, well. And he, he then reached out to Castro, wrote a handwritten note that was carried to, to Cuba secretly by Frank Mankiewicz, uh, somebody I think you knew, Bill, and very prominent. Democratic Party operative and became head of National Public Radio and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a quintessential liberal. And Kissinger's idea was that if leaked that he had sent a note to Castro, he'd just say that Frank Mankiewicz carried it on his own and uh, this would be plausible denial. So Kissinger actually engaged in secret talks. There was a se set of secret meetings, even a secret negotiating session at the Pierre Hotel. Wow. Yeah, I, I noticed I just yeah. was from this uh, review uh, today that it wasn't always uh, people who were trying, who were reaching out under President Reagan. Things came to a screeching halt. <laughs> well. uh, Alexander Haig, his Secretary of State, is quoted as saying that his inclination was, quote, to turn that fucking island into a parking lot. <laughs> well, that was, uh, yeah. this was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State that represented us yes. to the world. And this is what he's saying in the Oval Office to the President at the beginning of Reagan's term. But, you know, to, to the president and his top aides' credit, they basically said, Al, okay, you know, we're not going to let you do that. Uh, and even though they uh, did a number of punitive uh, things towards Cuba, including, I should say, putting Cuba on the, the terrorism list yeah, that the State Department yep. has that Obama is about to take them off of, and they put Cuba on the list because Fidel Castro wouldn't take orders from the White House on his policy in Central America. We had, Reagan in, got involved in secret diplomacy with Cuba, not to change relations, but to pass messages about the U.S. position on El Salvador and Nicaragua. And there was a secret meeting actually between Al Haig uh, and uh, Cuba's vice president in Mexico City in 1981. Then there was another secret meeting in Havana between the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency and, now, and soon to become U.N. Ambassador Vernon Walters and Fidel Castro in 1982. And the message was, we want you out of Central America. Stop supporting uh, the uh, Sandinistas. Stop giving uh, military training and advice to the guerrillas in El Salvador. And uh, do this. Get out or else. And the or else ended up being, we're putting you on this list. Oh. Uh, we're going to obfuscate revolution with terrorism. And, and now this is what's going to happen. So, Peter, did you go in, let me ask Peter, did you go in, in, in your book into Jimmy Carter's negotiations? Of course. And then Mary Al happened, which stopped that. Then the church committee uh, so, <laughs> sort yeah, of so put it to box. Stop and starts stops all the way through. Carter, 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 let me ask you Carter so picked now, up where Kissinger picked up left Kissinger, off yeah. uh, and actually shared a philosophy with, with Barack Obama that, that it's better to, to engage your enemies yeah. and it's preferable and possible to have positive relations with, with states that have been hostile and, and uh, as, as opposed to going to war with them. So are you optimistic now, Congresswoman, that this is going to work? I mean, because you have uh, well. a Republican-controlled Congress now that is not so inclined. Sure, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I say that because I think the president is doing everything he can do by executive action, first of all. Secondly, uh, the, the April 10th date is very important in terms yes. of opening of the embassy because the Summit of the Americas begins, I think, April 11th in Panama. And at the last Summit of the Americas, 95% uh, 90, of the countries in Latin America said, look, you, you all have to recognize Cuba. You know, So this is a, a shift in a regional policy also in Latin America and the Caribbean to be able to 
be at the summit of the Americas with the embassy open. So that's extremely important. I, the, and I've worked for years with Sam and others to try to get Cuba uh, taken off the list of uh, state sponsors of terrorism. The, the big issue is going to be the president hopefully will be able to do it, uh, but then we don't have to vote on it in Congress, but what could happen is a, a vote of disapproval could surface, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to mobilize to make sure that vote of disapproval does not pass, and that would be, and so we have to be vigilant, yeah. I would say. Now, does this mean that the embargo is over and American businesses can can no. you know, sell their products and build their hotels and it does not it does no. it does not mean that because you because up until uh, the spring of 1996 the US trade embargo was a presidential decree it had been started by Dwight Eisenhower and enforced and enhanced by John F Kennedy uh, after the Bay of Pigs by presidential decree and up until the spring of 1996, it could uh, be lifted by presidential decree. But President Clinton, in the aftermath of the shoot down of these little planes uh, over Cuban the Cuban case. coast, um, uh, gave it away to Congress. Uh, Senator, Senator Jesse Helms' office wanted to include it as part of the Helms-Burton bill, essentially. They said, now that uh, you know Cuba has done this awful thing shooting down these planes, we want you to sign the Helms-Burton bill. And not only that, we want to add the trade embargo as a codified law. And Clinton put up no resistance whatsoever. Uh, and it, he signed the Helms-Burton bill. And now it takes a vote of uh, this Republican Congress to fully lift uh, the trade embargo. But President Obama has kind of poked holes in the dam that the embargo is, and the water is rushing through. And there are, you know, even Republican constituents are coming to, to the Congress and saying, we want to sell corn and soybeans and lumber, and, and, and we want our cruise ships to be able to go, and I want to build a hotel. And, and, and you know, the, the idea here is that there's enough momentum and pressure uh, on the Republicans themselves um, to, to, to make this irreversible. Um, Do you see that, uh, Congresswoman? I mean, yeah. The chamber, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, has been one of the biggest supporters. Yeah, of this I, I just have to say, even in the '70s and '80s, businesses from America would go to, can't do business still because of the embargo. But b the business interests have been there for many, many, many decades now, and so I think that uh, the push from the business community is is really going to help push members to fully lift the embargo. But even the the right to travel right now. Even though the license under the uh, Obama regulations has, have been broadened and more people can travel and you certify that you're, you're traveling for a specific purpose, we have legislation now that I'm co-sponsoring with uh, Sanford, Congressman Sanford from South Carolina to fully Mark Sanford, Mark Sanford, South Carolina, Mark Republican. Mark Sanford, Republican, excuse me. Mark Sanford, Republican, South Carolina, who we're working Not with. mentioned the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> <laughs> I, We're I, talking I, about I, Cuba. No, that's right. <laughs> oh, God, to lift the to, to allow everyone to travel to Cuba freely. <laughs> so I'm cautiously optimistic once again that we that that could come before lifting the embargo. Okay. Fully. Well, I I would venture a guess that most of the people who are here tonight are here because they want to know how they can get to Cuba, how fast. <laughs> And, and, you know, what box they have to check yeah. or whatever. So who can travel to Cuba today? Start with Barbara and then... Uh, well, all, <laughs> journalists, healthcare professional, researchers, uh, teachers, uh, whomever. It, it's under a general license, and you, you can't go as a tourist, but you can go for a specific purpose. Humanitarian, uh, you, you can take medical equipment to Cuba. Uh, members of the clergy can go to Cuba. I think there are 12 categories which are very flexible. And, and you know, you don't want to violate any of the rules or, right now because things are moving pretty smoothly and swiftly. But to go to Cuba, to go to the beach, or to go to Cuba to hang out, or to go to Cuba to just do what you would normally do on a vacation, you are not allowed to do. Uh, officially. officially. But Peter, I've seen that list because, the truth be told, Carol and I have signed up uh, for a, 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 a the Nation magazine tour to Cuba, visit to Cuba in May. 
Uh, and we're going with Peter Kornbluh, uh, who's going to be leading that delegation. I looked at that list of 12 boxes, and I have to say, if you can't fit yourself into one of those 12 boxes, <laughs> you might as well stay home, right? I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty broad. Pretty broad, isn't it? Well, it's, 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 it's broad, but it's confusing. You are going on a trip uh, with The Nation magazine. The Nation magazine actually has an approved license to be a travel provider to Cuba. It got that license from a rather sinister sounding office called OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which uh, is the office in charge of controlling, uh, up until recently, our travel to, to, to Cuba uh, and making life difficult for us. Now, Obama's basically saying, you don't really, you don't need a special license to go because we're kind of going to automatically license you as an individual if you have what is called purposeful travel. Uh -huh. In other words, if your purpose is to go down and study salsa in Cuba <laughs> or the variants of the flavors of rum in Cuba, <laughs> then you can go, you know, if uh, for purposeful educational travel or for religious travel or for journalistic travel or for humanitarian travel. If you're going for people-to-people -people travel, then you're still supposed to go under a pe licensed people-to-people -people type of provider, which The Nation magazine is. But, you know, it's still a rigmarole, and it's, it would be a lot easier if Congress voted to give us back our rights as American citizens to travel where we want to travel, where it's safe to do so. And Cuba, quite frankly, is the only country that we're not allowed to freely travel to. <laughs> North Korea is safer than Cuba, apparently, for U.S. citizens. Syria is safer than Cuba for U.S. citizens to travel. And, and uh, this is why I think the, the first and, and, and most important vote in Congress to test the waters of how really this nation is f dealing with the change that Obama has brought to Cuba policy will be a complete lifting of the ban on travel. Travel, yeah. And that's what we're mm -hmm. focused on as so a Congressman, uh, tell us about... I mean, you've been down there so often. From what you've, you've observed, what changes, are, uh, w what difference are these new rules going to make for the people of Cuba? Because they, they have suffered under the embargo, haven't they? People have suffered under the embargo. You can look at many, uh, for example, uh, medicine and health care uh, devices and medical equipment. And I've talked to the Ministry of Health many times, uh, and people have actually died because they could not get the type of equipment to uh, treat patients for certain diseases, nor could they get the type of uh, re repairs and parts for these machines because of the embargo. So I think this is going to be a real life-saving uh, mm -hmm. effort, I think. But also, we're going to benefit because Cuban has, Cuba has a, a great health care system. And while it's a poor country, they've made many scientific uh, advances, such as the treatment for uh, diabetic ulcers. When people uh, develop ulcers as a result of diabetes, oftentimes uh, amputations, you know, they must have amputations. And I know this very well because, as you know, in the African-American community, diabetes is off the scale, so we have a lot of amputations that take place. Well, Cuba has a, a, a treatment now that prevents 70 to 80 percent of amputations as a result of diabetic ulcers. So we can, and we're trying to get that treatment here. So the U.S., our, you know, we will benefit also from opening up and ending the embargo. But also in terms of just the standard of living in, in Cuba. You know, when you have, and, and you, you have people who are very smart people, very uh, energetic, very competent people in Cuba who really want to develop their country, such as in the ag industry. They import probably 70, 80 percent of their food. Well, if we could have, you know, the ag industry here, farmers here, uh, agricultural companies help them, not necessarily uh, to take away, but to and, and ensure that they buy our products at a huge, huge profit, but help them develop their ag sector so that they can feed themselves and so they can have their own development of the country in the way they want to develop it. And I think our companies and our ag industry certainly can do that to help. And Peter, you were there when, uh, in December when the president announced this. I mean, what was the reaction among the people? Again, in their daily lives, I mean, it's going to make a, or 
a huge I, difference, right? I, I happen to be with almost all the analysts of U.S.-Cuban relations in Havana on December 17, 2014, when the news broke that Alan Gross uh, was on a plane back to the United States and that the Cuban three, the three remaining spies, were, had already landed in, 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 uh, in Havana. Um, and, uh, and that both presidents were going to speak on television at noon. This was, you know, about 10 o'clock in the morning. And that we were learning about all of this. And, uh, you know, just all hell broke out, re really, uh, to, to put it mildly. I mean, student, Cuban students flooded into the street. Their focus was on the fact that these three guys who they feel are heroes and counterterrorism agents um, were finally coming back after 16 long years in U.S. prisons. Uh, I mean, talk about an injustice. Uh, and. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, the, you know, it, it, thereafter, kind of the realization and the expectation settled in that a change in relations with the United States was going to bring significant improvement uh, in their economic and, and daily lives, in part because for many, many years, during, particularly during Fidel's long tenure, the embargo was blamed uh, for just about every economic ill uh, in Cuba. Under Raul, he's been much more pragmatic about saying, you know, we're kind of responsible for our own mismanagement, problems, corruption, lack of production, uh, and we have to focus on ourselves. But the expectation is that with improved relations with the United States, there's going to be more tourism, there's going to be more ability to get goods. The very next morning, I got into a, a Jobs cab. Jobs and better wages. and I got into a cab, and, the, and the, the taxi driver said to me, I've been sitting around talking with my fellow taxi drivers. We all want to get a new Ford van. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think I have to say I think he really expected that they were going to be able to get one pretty soon, uh, and I didn't want to disavow him of uh, the fact that it might actually take some time before <laughs> cars are exported from the United States to 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 Cuba. But you know uh, there is a, a a significant expectation in Cuba that the daily lives of Cubans are going to improve, and and in fact. There is going to be an improvement. One of the things that, that President Obama has done that people haven't really focused on is he quadrupled the, the ceiling on remittances uh, that families uh, in the United States can now send back. And that money is going right into economic development. All the families are getting that are, are redoing their houses, buying new houses, building small businesses, hiring people. Um, uh, and that'll be, that'll be important. But, but guess what? Because and on the remittance piece, and I've, I've talked to the Cubans and our own government about this, because the majority of Cubans who left Cuba were white, Sure. you have the Afro-Cuban population now experiencing an economic divide in terms of income inequality that's really becoming a problem. Because the remittances, who do they, who, they come from the families in Miami. Okay, so they naturally they go back to the families, and these are not Afro-Cubans, and so that's one issue that has got to be really looked at, and the Cubans know this, and so to their credit, they're really trying to address that. But this divide is is growing. But also, let me just mention a backstory. I was in Cuba that week, also. Oh, you and, were. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> but to show you how they kept I came the, to your hotel looking hotel. for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Saratoga, I, right? That's right. Right. <laughs> that's <laughs> where I was, and and. No, and not knowing that this was about to happen, show you how under wraps it was kept, though. Here, member of Congress, been really involved in a lot, a lot of the negotiations, what happened. Still didn't know for sure, so I waited and waited away. Went on and caught my flight back to Miami. I get a call. I'm sitting on the runway at in the my, airport in, in Miami. Miami saying, okay, we want you to go with the delegation to meet Alan. <laughs> the plane's going to take off. So I could not, I have just... You know, I could not get to Havana. I couldn't get off the plane to get to, get to, to Andrews Air Force Base to get to Havana to be with the delegation to come back with Alan. You think they might have given... <laughs> now, that shows you how they kept this... They might have given you a little advance notice, huh? <laughs> well, it was, it was kept a big secret. Uh, and, um, and, you know, in it, the secrecy, there was success, so it's hard to... Yeah, it's hard yeah to so I don't... Wait, wait, it's just... Right. Personally, I like. Oh, All right, so um, let's say I'm a member of this audience. I want to go to Cuba. Can I just call up um, Delta, American Airlines, and book a flight? You still have to go book your flight through charter companies, of which there are quite a few. 
they operate out of Tampa and Miami. Uh, there's going to be a New, New York Jersey, flight yeah. that's starting up, New Jersey. Um, there's a New Orleans flight, uh, which has become famous in the last couple of days, because supposedly uh, oh, Robert Durst Robert was going to get on it. Oh uh, and, and, um, <laughs> and so you, you, call, it, you call up uh, one of these places, and, and you say, I'm going for purposeful travel to, to, to Cuba, and they say, here's your ticket. Let me, let me say, from my experience over the, over the years, I, uh, and, and I'm suggesting one travel company for those who want to go, and that's Marisol, only because they've done this for years and years and years, and they Marisol. know the rules, Marisol, M-A-R-A-Z-U-L. -A They're out of New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. I, and that's okay. yeah. Marisol. With, with regard to Marisol, uh -huh. I just returned from Cuba, and I tried on a short notice to go there, and uh, I was amazed at the different conflicting information I got. And one of them was from Marasur. They say uh -huh. you have to make an application. Uh -huh. It takes three weeks. None of uh -huh. the restrictions of travel from the United States to Cuba have been changed. Uh -huh. I teach, so I could uh -huh. go with number five as a university professor, but I would have to commit that I don't do anything touristy. Uh -huh. And so I hung up. Uh -huh. And then I went to ABC. Uh -huh. Folks, if you want to go to Cuba, yeah. that's the way to go. <laughs> I should. I, okay. I should say that we fly with the Nation ABC magazine too. through Nation through ABC Charters as well. Uh, oh, yes, okay. through Tampa. Actually. <laughs> yes. So, but you fly out of Miami with American Airlines. Or Tampa. Or Tampa. Oh, I, I or Tampa. Miami. Yeah, you can do Tampa. And they got me the visa. They got me the OFAC, whatever, with a um, number that I am totally legal. And I was so amazed because it defies the laws as they are described. And I looked at the web page from the Department <laughs> of Commerce, State Department. No way you can do that. Nothing what? has changed. Uh, uh, another practical question I have to ask, which is when we went, you had to take cash. I mean, yeah. we each uh, you still piles do. of cash. We divided it up. And can, so can you use a credit card when you go now? No. First of all, I thought, and I don't know whether you thought this as well, I thought that only Americans couldn't use credit cards. Uh, but it turns out that Cuba really doesn't have any infrastructure for using credit cards for Europeans or anybody else. Um, there are a few uh, hotels, and there are like maybe, I don't know, five ATM machines in all of Havana, something like that, for mostly used by Europeans. But the truth is that the electronic grid and the communications network and the relationships with these banks that do the credit cards is just not structured. It's not set up. It's not developed with the, with the Cuban uh, economy at this point. MasterCard says it's going in there. It's going to work on this. There's a whole issue of the United States and the banks that, that refuse to work with Cuba because Cuba's been on the terrorism list and because of the embargo and the sanctions that it puts on Cuba for financial services. And this is what the negotiators are trying to resolve right now, this week, in Cuba, between the United States and Cuba, is, is normalizing the banking industry and banking services uh, and diplomatic kind of exchanges that will allow these banks to work and the accounts to be created and the electronic network to be built so that someday we can use our credit cards there sooner rather than later. But for those of you who are going to go soon, you're still going to have to take uh, oodles of cash. Also, That's internet right. access. Internet. At this point. Well, I, I want to, yeah. So part, Coming, maybe one yet. more quick question and then we'll go to the audience here. But um, part, of the part of the new uh, um, regulations or rules or agreement is that we would that we would have internet companies could could go to American internet companies could go and introduce new technology and everything, which has been a real problem in Cuba. Is that going to be easily done, Congresswoman? From what you've seen, then Peter, get your comment too, because there's been a lot of restrictions. A lot on of the restrictions under the, the Castro the, regime. According to the Cubans, they want they internet want it. access. That's what they tell us, and, and it was mainly the embargo that was prohibiting and preventing. U.S. internet companies from accessing the island. When we were there, not this last time, but the time before Google was actually there, before the uh, president announced uh, the, the new mm -hmm. regs. Okay. So I know uh, internet companies, high-tech companies are down there probably every day now. And I believe even though, you know, it's probably hard, it is hard for the Cubans because this is part of 
this transition that they have to make in terms of opening up, uh, there could be some resistance, you know, just based on their structural issues and how they've, they're set up. But when you talk to them, you know, I'm convinced that they want to do this. But will in there terms be resistance access. based on the fact that the internet is democracy alive? I mean, people can say anything they want about the government. I think it's or, more they don't know much about it. Yeah, and, and of course, the, the whole issue of freedom of the press and all right. of the other issues that go along with that. But I think also on top of that, you have the, the, the uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. issues that I don't know if they're ready to really deal with. Quick comment, Peter, on that? Well, you know, Google has gone to, 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 the chairman of the board of Google has gone to Cuba. He's pushed to be able to have Google access to Cuba. It's not, it, it, the embargo prevented Google from having any accounts from Cuba. So, if you, you know, we, we would be in Cuba and trying to access our Google account, and you'd get kicked off your Google mail all the time there because of this. That's going to change now because it's now going to be legal for Google, under Obama's new plan, to, to be there. The infrastructure in Cuba is not there in a, in a way. They're just opening up their first public access kind of center for internet and with a price that some Cubans can afford. It's very difficult in the hotels to do this. A whole new infrastructure has to be built. They're going to have to contract with some kind of major international company to, to, to bring this service to Cuba. But you know, it's going to come because Cuba can't really move into the modern economic age uh, without it. Uh, there is a tension between a society in which information and certainly news and information has been very strictly controlled for more than half a century. Anybody who's gone to Cuba, read the two Communist Party newspapers there knows that, that uh, Cuba is really very far behind many, many other societies in terms of access to, 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 to news and, and modern reporting and, and what's going on around, around the world. And that, of course, is, the, is what's going to change with the internet um, and needs to change though, because Cuba can't really economically be a modern society without it. Yeah. Boy, make sure you want to pack up and go right now. Um, I saw a phone question here, and then we'll just uh, open up. Yeah, so let's start here. Before credit cards become available, and they will come someday, On, the currency to take is not U.S. dollars, it's euros. You've got a special time right now. The euro is down a lot, <laughs> and you get regular uh, conversion rate in Cuba. Whereas they charge you a special high rate for the U.S. dollar. Well, that's 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 not exactly correct. You you have to you take your euros, but you have to convert them to Cuban convertible currency, and there's a kind of a tax on that, um, and the tax on that is a, a certain percent. It's a little less than converting dollars, but it's not a lot less. So yes, you can buy euros for cheaper, but, but, but to take your euros, you have to actually buy them, so you lose a percentage of your dollars in just buying euros to go there. Actually, so now you go with dollars, and you're basically getting about 87 or 88 pennies to the dollar when you convert to Cuban currency, which you, you will have to do once you get there. OK. Uh, yes. How? How? Very interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, if I may, two quick questions. One, to what extent has the Cuban community in the U.S., and particularly the politics of Florida, held this whole thing up? And second, um, is there some discussion about Cuban membership in the IMF and the World Bank, which could help pave the way to getting some of the economic reforms they need? In terms of the politics, I think th there's still some resistance from the Cuban American community and those who are part of the the day, the old school, but the majority of Cuban Americans now, especially now with the travel back and forth, the remittances, the younger Cubans, I think all the polling data has shown that uh, normalization and ending the embargo is where people are. I think you know, those that are trying to hold on to this 50-year-old failed policy, 50-plus failed policy, and we counted 10 presidents, U.S. presidents, I think. Uh, you, you know, I think their day is coming to an end, but I think that they are trying to resist this with everything they have. You know, I don't think they're going to win. Well, on the other question? I IMF, guess, World Bank. The IMF? 
Well, let me just say on the, on the polling mm -hmm. issue, there have been four polls taken since Barack Obama's stunning announcement in December of changing Cuba policy. All of them have shown a majority of people are in favor of this. Even a recent polls showed that 51% of Republicans across the country are, are in favor of this. Certainly they show that more than 60% of the Cuban Americans uh, in uh, Florida are uh, in favor of this. Um, the problem, of course, is that the three or four Cuban Americans in the U.S. Congress and Senate uh, are from districts that are not really in favor of it and uh, have been there a long time and hold a, a lot of sway uh, on uh, some of yeah. the uh, various bills and legislation. So we'll have to see what happens. On the uh, IMF? Uh, so so uh, President Obama has, uh, in, in the changes that he's announced, do make it, does make it possible for Cuba, if it wants to, to to rejoin the OAS, to access the Inter-American Development Bank, to go to the World Bank and the IMF. Whether Cuba wants to do that is a whole other uh, issue. Uh, I don't think uh, Cuba has quite arrived there yet. Let's see what happens. There's a number of other multilateral banking infrastructures that are available on a regional level in Latin America. And let's see what happens at the Summit of the Americas when Raul Castro goes there in just less than four weeks. Uh, in which he will be offered all sorts of economic support, I think, from the countries that are there. I suspect before the IMF and World Bank, uh, the OAS would be probably the, the first step into joining the international. Yeah, IDB. Okay, and I'll repeat the question just for the, uh, the audience. There, there have been recent cases of yachts stopping in Cuba, often because of major problems and the need for major repairs. And when they arrive back in the United States, um, the yachts are impounded um, and um, confiscated. And, you know, I'm just kind of curious about where we stand with respect to that. So I, the, I believe it's by the Department of Treasury. The question is about yachts, American yachts, which stop in Cuba for whatever reason, some of them because they need to, to get new provisions or need, need repairs, and when they come to this country, they are impounded by the Department of Treasury? I think it's Department of Treasury. Uh, Either of you familiar with I, I'm, that? I'm not familiar with any of these yachts. Uh, uh, never been on one. Um, but I don't think that's going to be happening anymore. Um, I, I, uh, I certainly, you know, anybody who announces openly I'm on vacation in Cuba uh, uh, is going to draw attention to the fact that the rules still say you're not supposed to vacation in Cuba. But anybody who makes even the most, I think, feeble effort, if you will, to say, I'm going to Cuba for a purposeful travel, uh, including people on yachts, um, I think are, 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 legally able to, 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 are legally able to do this. I think the, the president is trying to do what he can under executive order. Uh, given that it still takes a vote in Congress to lift the travel ban to allow us to go to Cuba, and frankly, we should take them up on it. We should go. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, do you see it being to our advantage to go sooner rather than later in terms of it being more authentic right now and whether the prices are going to fluctuate? Question, yeah. should we go, is it better to go sooner rather than later? <laughs> uh, personally, I would say sooner rather than later. Yeah. I get asked this question all the time, you know, I want to go to Cuba before everything changes. Yes. And, and I think, and, and then I, I went with a, a group from The Nation magazine, and a number of people said, don't the Cubans understand what's going to happen when, you know, Coca-Cola comes back in here and, uh, and uh, McDonald's comes here and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, those big, you know, agricultural corporations and their chemicals. And, and I said, you know, the, the, the Cubans do understand, actually. And, it, and just because Barack Obama says, I'm going to open up to Cuba, doesn't mean that Cuba is going to completely open up to every major U.S. corporation that comes. And first of all, you know, Congressman Lee has to get all those Republicans to vote to lift the embargo before any of them can actually do that. Uh, so these things, A, aren't going to happen soon. And many of the things that people fear happening in Cuba may not happen for, for another generation. Yeah, um, you know, on one of my delegations, I went down with uh, an international association of, of planners and architects. And the purpose, Sam was on that visit. Congressman Sam Farr referenced uh, Sam several Farr, times uh, tonight. From California, from California. who's Monterey, been to Cuba several sir. times. Great and we uh, worked with the Cubans to look at post-ending the embargo. This was years ago when we did this. And 
we came away convinced with these architects from all around the world, including the United States, that Cuba knew exactly what they were doing in terms of historic preservation, in terms of keeping the Malacan the way they decided they wanted to keep it, in terms of their city planning, in terms of how they want to see their country. They were very clear on what they were not going to allow uh, in terms of the, the Walmart. I was going to ask, do they the have the government structure in place that would prevent it becoming another Miami or Ocean Beach, Maryland, or <laughs> Ocean Bill, City, I mean? I mean you're going in May, and you're going to see the same Communist Party in place in Cuba that was there in place, you know, when you were there in 1998. So it's still in place. Uh, and, uh, that's a yes? That's okay. a yes. Uh, we'll come over here, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. You have the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think Peter mentioned earlier, any change at all has to get through Congress. And to get through Congress, it has to get out of the Foreign Relations Committee onto the floor. And so far, historically, nothing much has been able to get out of the committees to get a vote on the floor. But my question to both of our speakers Please is... speak into the microphone? Oh, into the... Uh, and this is little known to, to most people. Um, we, we don't have an exact figure, but somewhere between 100 million, 150 million every year of your money and my money, taxpayers' money, funds from Congress funds what I call phony anti-Cuba projects. And that money, part of that money, it goes to Miami to these projects. And part of it comes back in campaign contributions to a handful of people. And most of these people are what we call the Cuban mafia on the Hill. And these people What is the stacked. question? <laughs> My question is, to what degree do you think this plays and the prevention and the future prevention of getting any of this legislation out of the committees and getting votes on the floor. Okay. Well, as I said, I'm you, cautiously I optimistic because I think we've heard and we know that public opinion is, is with us, first of all. Secondly, it's going to be a fight. And I think we have to chip away at it. We're building the bipartisan support now to do this. We don't know what the opposition is going to look like when we move forward on it, but I think what was said earlier in terms of the executive actions that have been taken, the president's going as far as he can go and, and pretty soon to end to repeal Helms Burton, which is what we have to do. How can we get rid of the money well, let's have public financing the campaigns for the, you know, that. That's one thing we have to do. Secondly, I am looking, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm on the Appropriations Committee uh, and USAID and other funding streams that fund uh, projects that probably aren't about real development. I don't think we need to really look at that. But this is political, and so this is going to take constituencies going to their members of Congress and saying, look, vote to support ending the travel ban and, and repealing Helms Burden. And this is going to be our work, your work in here. Uh, y yes, sir. So the question, I guess, is if we're the only ones who can travel there and Europeans and South Americans can, why is Cuba still, why haven't they done more to develop the island, I guess? Why is Cuba still so underdeveloped? Well, they have done things to, to, to help the island develop. Um, Share it uh, Industries from Canada is the big mining company in, in Cuba. They employ X hundreds of, of Cubans in the nickel mines. Uh, there. Um, Norway has uh, got a number of programs and has had a number of programs over the years, including helping Cuba search for oil. Uh, China has been uh, in Cuba. Uh, the, the Dutch and the Spanish have built hotels. Um, and, and those things have changed Cuba. I mean, and when Bill goes, um, you know, uh, in May, he's going to see a very different uh, part of Cuba and, uh, than he saw in 1998 when uh, we were there uh, before. Things have, things have developed and they're developing even further. But the truth of the matter is, is that the United States for over 100 years was Cuba's natural trading partner. A lot of 
people who are really interested in serious big investments in Cuba back in the type of investments that their families had before they left are in Miami and would eventually like to reinvest uh, in, in Cuba. Um, we are, in, just because of our proximity, uh, the natural uh, kind of route and trading partner and food provider and, 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 uh, 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 and, and allied country. And so and we've cut that off for, for many, many, many years now. Um, and the question's going to be how Cuba controls it coming back once the Congress comes to its senses and, and votes to lift the embargo. And, um, uh, and that all, that'll all develop. Um, and I think that we will all go soon, and I think we'll all go later, and we'll be able to watch that development uh, take place. Is Cuba going to start looking like Miami? I don't think so. Uh, certainly not under the type of sit government system that it has Before now. Before we get your question, Congresswoman, what about Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay? <laughs> uh, does that, is this part of this agreement that it goes yeah. back to Cuba? That's, uh, you know, that's certainly something that's going to be on the, the drawing board in, in terms of the discussions. I don't think that's the priority right now from the Cuban side, but and the history of this is really kind of convoluted in terms of the lease and how all this got worked out. But I know for a fact right. that the Treasury Department sends Havana 4000 Rent checks. Some $300 a year in rent checks. Checks. They've never been cashed. Not a single they one. They say Fidel has them in his drawer. <laughs> and they've never been cashed throughout this entire time. Whoa. And I think that says something about how important and Gitmo is, but how they view uh, this as we move forward. Whoa. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Coming here and going through Miami and pretty much getting to stay in America and be, become citizens or whatever. And, and when this first was announced, that seemed to be a sticking point because um, Cuba still wants us to send them back. So where are we with that? I don't think Cuba wants to send us to send them back. Is no, what Cuba does, what Cuba wants uh. is for us to create a magnet for people to leave in a dangerous way by offering them the, the Cuba Adjustment Act, which is still in force, which says that if Cubans now get to American soil, they can apply stay. and stay. And that sets them apart from all other refugees and, and, and migrants uh, who come from all over the world who aren't allowed to automatically stay if they get here. Uh, and um, what's really changed the equation is that Cuba is basically now allowing people to go and come back. Raul Castro has changed the policy of uh, immigration from Cuba. And it was that Cubans made it very difficult for their own people to leave the country. And now they've made it a lot easier and they've said, if you go, we're not gonna hold it against you. You can go, stay away for however many years, send money back, and if you wanna come back, come back. And that changes the whole political rationale here where this law that we have that's special to Cuba, the Cuban Adjustment Act from the mid 1960s, was intended to say, we're you know, free democracy and we welcome all the refugees from communism. But now we're just getting people coming and going back. And so the politics of it, they aren't opposing the regime by coming here necessarily. Uh, and they may be able to go back with uh, whatever gains, earns, earnings, or situation they create here. So now you actually have a number of Republicans who are saying, we probably shouldn't continue with this. Yeah, Cuban Adjustment just, Act needs to be looked at. Yeah. We need to get that off. Just uh, time for a, a couple more questions here in the green sweater for St. Patrick's Day. We have to recognize that. Now, how do you think that is, probably just more for Congress, um, this will change positively So how will this impact uh, Afro Afro the Afro-Cuban Afro community? Yeah, I think it's going to be in a Cuba. positive development for a couple of reasons. One is with ending the embargo, we'll see increased trade, increased investment, which uh, ultimately leads to job creation in Cuba. And the Cubans are very well aware of this growing income inequality. Uh, secondly, the Cubans, I believe, now will see, you know, the, African-Americans are coming to Cuba, and actually I've talked to many uh, 
civil rights leaders and others say we've got to really come up with some plans now to make sure that this inequality begins to close. Uh, thirdly, I think you'll, you're going to see more uh, African Americans once we can figure out, cause, because now remittances, individuals can send money. And what I'm encouraging, especially with African Americans, members of the clergy, is to find organizations in Cuba or individuals that you can send money to in the Afro-Cuban community to help them develop small businesses, help them become entrepreneurs also. So I think we're going to see more uh, assistance and remittances coming from other people now that would go directly to the uh, to a, uh, Right, and I just want to say, uh, uh, since you're on the Appropriations Committee, one of the great changes that could take place is that money that gets appropriated for the regime change programs through AID like could Zuzanel get appropriated, could HIV get appropriated AIDS. for the type of targeted job training programs and development programs uh, for the Afro-Cuban community and, and other parts of the, the Cuban community. Well, you know what? That's uh, a just, good idea. As we mark this bill up, I just might try an right. amendment on that. Back to, let's do it. <laughs> good idea. No, we're getting some things done here, right? <laughs> right why not? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Press uh, preempted my question about Guantanamo, so thank you for asking that question. But I was always uh, also really curious about the rapidity with which we're going to open an embassy, and I was just wondering, is is the infrastructure in place and has just been sort of mothballed for the last No, it's going to need oh, to be no, upgraded. No, no, no. We've had an intersection in Havana since Jimmy Carter, since yeah, the since 70s. Yes, since 1977. And so 200, 300 employees, the, the, it needs upgrading. It's a huge embassy there, and actually, building, uh, I, I mean yeah. building, 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 intersection. It's, it's actually the Swiss government is the sort of holder of both the Cuban intersection here up on 16th Street and the United States intersection in Havana. So it's under the auspices of the Swiss. So what will happen, hopefully, is that the Swiss flag comes down and the U.S. flag goes up, and then we can start. And, and the plaque gets changed. And the plaque on the front. gets changed. It gets changed from U.S. interest section to U.S. US embassy. embassy. Right. But one of the things that used to happen, not, and this was when Bush was in, th that intersection had a ticker in front that had ah. these provocative messages about the Castro government. And so this was in front of a huge plaza. And here's, you've got this huge U.S. intersection ticker, you know, down with Fidel Castro, the, the whole nine yards. Well, it was on one of our delegations that we, we were trying to move the ball forward a bit in terms of negotiations. And so we said, well, you know, this is low-hanging fruit. Why, why is the U.S. doing this? Well, we got together, members, and within six weeks, we got that down. <laughs> and so that was, well. you know, a small little step, but just shows you what... Kind of Great discussion. We're running a little short on time. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Do. The second row there. Yes, sir. Please. Okay, I went to a session earlier this week, and um, the people felt, some of the people, I should say, four of the five panelists felt that this was a backdoor approach to still get the uh, communist people to change their habits or the channel for the regime change. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is this a backdoor approach to regime change? Uh. Well, that, that's an amazingly important uh, question. Uh, and I, uh, the, you know, the President of the United States said uh, in his uh, first interview uh, after he'd made this announcement that we're going to treat Cuba differently and we're going to normalize relations. But of course, the United States is going to continue to pursue its interests uh, in uh, democratic changes in Cuba and that Cuba is going to change. As he put it, it has to. Um, and. Uh, you know, we can't, our country is our, is our country, it's, it's, it's uh, pushed its interests in a lot of different ways, some of which many of us have opposed over the years in aggression. And the United States is going to continue, I think, through the bridges and vehicles and mechanisms of influence that it rebuilds uh, to Cuba to try and influence the situation there in the way that it wants to see it go. Um, but it's going to do it under a completely different framework now, hopefully of non-hostility, uh, of normal relations, and of you know, more, much more mutual respect. And, um, and I think that's a, a big gain. 
Uh, the United States is saying, we can coexist with the Cuban Revolution. We think our influence is still going to lead to positive change in Cuba, as supposedly it leads to change in other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take this. Uh, uh, okay, well, this is it. Last question right here. So um, if you are um, interested in um, becoming involved in moving this effort forward or volunteering, or what are some of the organizations that you can become involved with or... Right. Organization. Oh, we got the microphone. I don't have to One repeat. organization, Center for Democracy in the Americas, the Washington Office on Latin America, WOLA. Uh, there's several Log. Uh, church groups. Which one? LOG, the Latin Log. American Working Group. Uh, the church That's groups. Cuba Now. Cuba Now. That might be harder to uh, <laughs> to uh, to join. There's, you know, there's a number of, 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 of church uh, uh, groups um, that, that work on, on Cuba. Some of them are in the, the Maryland building um, uh, here on Capitol Hill. Progressive Baptist National Convention. Uh, they just sent a delegation down. And um, uh, Global Reach. Uh, uh, um, Global Exchange. Global Exchange. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the one thing, if, if you can get yourself to Cuba, Code Pink is working on Cuba now, and they just oh, took yeah. 150 people, and they're going to take another 150 people. Um, the Center for Paul, Cuban Studies, Sandy yeah. Levinson. Sandy <laughs> Levinson in New York. <laughs> An endless number of uh, organizations. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to, first of all, thank you both. And be, but before you, thank you both. Oh, well, thank you all. <laughs> I just want to end with a note about the complexity of these negotiations uh, and the extent to which people really did all that they could to bring this about. Uh, and the story comes to me from um, Chris Van Hollen, who was part of this effort. You know, when you mentioned the, the last three of the Cuban Five, when they arrived in Cuba, um, one of them who'd been in prison here for 16 years uh, was greeted by his wife, who was pregnant. <laughs> Now that was... And yeah. everybody said, what's going on here? And they were buddy-buddy. I mean, they were like, you know, still to, very much in love. Yeah, and right, like, very hmm. much. He was and, in jail, uh, and she was in Cuba. It was revealed that while he was in jail here, part of the negotiations was that his, his sperm would be sent to Cuba. So she was pregnant with their child. And the person who was most instrumental in arranging this exchange was Senator Pat Leahy from Vermont, who is now known by his colleagues as the inseminator in chief. <laughs> so you gotta love it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, that was. Go to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs>